Perhaps in every other game that you play, your opponents try to pin your knight like this. And today we're gonna have a look at how Capablanca punished his opponents for doing so. Capablanca was the world champ and is considered one of the brightest chess talents in history, so let's go ahead and get started. In this game, Capablanca was playing black against winter, plain white. Now the beginning is more or less opening. Actually, you know, there are different ways for both sides to develop on the first moves, but it doesn't really matter as the pin may occur in various kinds of positions. So white traded, played d3, black played bishop d6 to defend this pawn, and here comes bishop g5, the favorite move of all the amateur players. Now, first off, Capablanca plays h6, and I do recommend that you play this move whenever your opponent tries bishop g5 pin. This forces your opponent to make a decision whether the bishop is going to take here, or go back, or retreat somewhere else. And after that, even if your opponent decides to maintain the pin, as white did in the game, he'll always have an extra resource of pushing the pawn forward to g5 whenever you find it necessary. But Capablanca played a much more subtle move. He played c5. The move that prevents white from possibly striking in the center in the future, but also rather invites white to execute his main attacking idea. White wants to capitalize on this pin, and if they want to attack the knight, they naturally want to bring the knight over here, which adds one more attack to this knight. Now, temporarily it may feel like black's gonna mess up something, because white wants to take here, disrupt the pawn structure, expose the king, and that's all that white really wants. But here's the second stage, Capablanca plays pawn to g5 and it actually is the beginning of quite a remarkable plan, which we're gonna see in a moment. Now, here I decided to trade on f6. By the way, just a quick note, whenever you go g5, after you have castled already, watch over your opponent trying to sack the knight right there. In some positions it may be dangerous if he does that, sacrifice the knight, and the idea would be that after this trade, if you can't get out of this pin, you know, that can become bad, why can actually win this knight and expose your king. In this particular case, let's take it back, Capablanca knew that it's not gonna work for white, because if white tried knight to g5, instead of recapturing immediately, Capablanca would first trade off on d5, and this intermediate move makes a big difference, because now the queen is actually active along this diagonal, and if black recaptures, not only black won a knight, but this pawn is supported by the queen, and it attacks the bishop, therefore the bishop would have to draw back, and now black is just up a piece with no compensation for white. Therefore, in this position, this sacrifice would not be dangerous for black, but just be sure that you watch over this idea for white, and that it does not work when you play the move g5. Anyway, let's go ahead. In the game, white decided to trade on f6, queen recaptures, and now the bishop has to go, the bishop draws back to g3. And some players may just pay attention to the fact that the black king is a little bit exposed and may see it as a downside of the black position. But in reality, it's completely opposite, because the main factor which Capablanca noticed is the fact that this bishop is now imprisoned. It is completely caged. Just, just have a look. It can't go, it, it literally has no squares where it could possibly go to without being captured immediately. And it's kind of like White is playing all chess so that he agrees to play without the bishop from now on, right? So you have this big advantage. And there are two major plans for you to capitalize on that. One is the move bishop g4, and generally speaking, the plan uh, that Capablanca decided to use, he decided, you know what, if this bishop is out of the game, let's just fix the situation as it is, and I'll now shift my attention to the other side of the board and play there, where I technically have an extra piece, right? So that was the Capablanca plan, we'll have a look at that thing in a moment, but just for the sake of, you know, complete understanding of the situation, let me also share another plan, which is also very effective. Sometimes you can use the fact that you already started your expansion on the king side, and you can continue doing so by going pawn h5. And all of a sudden, you turn the situation around. Why was hoping to attack on the king side, but now you are the one attacking. So you threaten pawn h4, capturing this bishop. Also, if your opponent tries to, you know, provide an escape square somehow, so you gain one more tempo to attack, the bishop drops back, now you also have one more tempo to go g4 and chase away the, the knight from here. If white trades, that allows you to bring the bishop over here with a tempo, and now you use the counter pin, now you pin the white knight. And on top of that, you threaten h3 to undermine this whole construction, which is really fragile. You've got the g-file for your rook, potentially you can go like this, and put a rook on this file and start your attack, and quite often in positions like that you crush white within just a few moves. So that's a really powerful plan, how to turn the situation around and to attack yourself on the king side. In the game, Capablanca chosen a slower but surer way, he played bishop g4, 
and we'll see an idea in a second. Why I didn't figure out was the point, just played pawn h3 and Capablanca happily traded off everything on f3 and played f6 to just lock the position on the king side completely. And here's the deal, now this bishop not only has no squares to go to, I mean apart from h2 which doesn't do anything, but it has no way out completely. Because if white ever wanted to activate the bishop, he'd wish to possibly move this pawn forward and vacate this f2 square for the bishop to go back to life. But because of these doubled pawns, that is now unavailable. So if pawn were on g2, white could push the f pawn forward and free up the space for the bishop. But because of the double pawns, the bishop is now completely in a hopeless position. There is just no way out and is completely imprisoned. So that's why Capablanca played bishop g4. Not because he wanted to target the king. He wanted to fix the situation where the bishop is completely imprisoned. And after that, he just went to attack on the queen side and he easily won the game because he's got virtually an extra bishop there so he can double down on his attack there and white has two rooks, black has two rooks plus a bishop so that is easily winning and he won the game later. Here's another example where Capablanca used a similar plan in a completely different position. This time he's got a more formidable opponent, Frank Marshall, who was one of the best players at the time and Marshall played bishop g4 established in this pin. Now, Kava played rook to e1 and that vacates the f1 square for his knight and this is a really classical maneuver and really good one. From here the knight can jump either to g3 or to e3 and in both cases it helps you to reposition the knight to a better square and to chase away this bishop. Black played h6, white played knight f1, knight h7, perhaps black is hoping to play f5 and starts his attack there on the king side, but here comes knight e3 attacking this bishop, black played bishop h5. By the way, if black ever trades on f3 instead, that's actually pretty good for white, because after that you bring the queen out, your knight has a bunch of good squares, which can no longer be controlled by his bishop, as he traded it off, the queen is active, you can put it over here against his king, life's good. So let's come back, after knight f3 the bishop is attacked, oops, so black went here, and here Capablanca played the same move g4, this time he did not even need to play a preparatory move pawn h3, because this knight already guards the pawn, and he breaks the pin, and simultaneously expands on the king side and he uses that to start his own attack there so it's just again quite a funny case where black was hoping to play a five and to capitalize on the pin to develop his own attack and within just two moves capablanca completely reversed the situation where now he's the one expanding on the king side black is the one defending and it's actually quite tough now this knight on f5 is dominating over the position, you know, putting a lot of pressure all around, and if black ever trades it, after a pawn takes, white now opens up this file for his rook, so for instance if let's say black wants to take away the king, white does the same, now rook g1 is coming, so what can black do, let's say knight g5 to bring the knight back into play, rook g1, now putting pressure, let's say black trades, now black may feel the pressure against this pawn, let's say black goes something like this, I mean, I'm fantasizing, but I'm showing you potentially realistic moves that, you know, could happen in a game. And now I can just capitalize on this attack, go queen h5, and you can see how easy white attack is. You just want to trade on h6 on the next move, if black does not prevent it. Bishop h6, and you're gonna open up the h file and checkmate black with the linear checkmate along these two files. So that's how easy your attack can be, how you expand and how you attack. If king h7, by the way, there's a fun resource here. You can actually go rook g6 and insist on this sacrifice on h6, despite of the fact that it loses the rook. Because after that, nothing really changes. We still want to get to this pawn, get to the king and checkmate it. If king goes back, you can force it with this check to the corner and after that bishop h6 is finishing the game off in style. Pawn takes, queen takes, now this is a checkmate, given the fact that our bishop is controlling this square, and we even have queen h7, possibly in some variations check, but now we don't need it because this is straightforward checkmate. So that's how easily you can attack when you know this idea that you can use your opponent's bishop to expand on the king side and to turn the situation around and start your own attack. If you have any doubts or questions about this whole thing, then I'd recommend that you check out this video where Gary Kasparov shows how he handles such pins. And this is really closely connected, but you'll get to know a few other additional ideas which will be helpful in connection to this video. So check it out and have a great rest of the day.